let's let's close out this chapter <coughs> by looking at uh, what the way forward is seen to be for Earth system models. This is a paper on uh, talking about how Earth system models need to serve the uh, demand for information from societies, uh, decision makers, policy makers, and so on. Uh, the term policymaker is used very broadly, but there is not always some community that is sitting there and creating all the policies. So there is various political processes involved, uh, people's inputs, uh, elections, etc., on how policies are made. Nonetheless, if we look at current tendencies in a, a few things, uh, in the current state-of-the-art models, uh, they're oriented towards improving predictive precision of the components independently, like uh, for let's say heat waves for precipitation, for crop yields, for ocean, for land, and so on. So the focus needs to move to uh, improving uh, com the components uh, to increase overall confidence in model projections. They are currently oriented towards precision of individual predictions over uh, estimation of uncertainty. Uh, so the bias towards accuracy of predictions, which requires uncertainty estimation, uh, needs to be uh, increased. Uh, detail uh, in, uh, incorporated because of uh, because they are considered potentially important, whereas the proposed changes are that all detailed just all details justified by relevance, empirical evidence, and accuracy metrics should be included. Uh, obviously, this uh, keeps changing w as we collect more data, and that's a good thing, uh, on, as long as we can uh, track the uncertainties as well and constrain the parameters. Most detailed models used to make projections with confidence uh, assessment made using separate analysis. So detailed models are uh, analyzed and the confidence assessments are made using separate analysis, whereas they focus, uh, they pr propose focusing on adopting the most informative overall balance of details, including measures of uncertainty, and so on. So let's one, last one, for example, here, better suited to scientific exploration of the plausible. So you're looking at a sp phase space where all these feedbacks give you a range of uh, outcomes in a phase space, whereas the, uh, the proposed changes are to focus on uh, being better suited to identification of the probable with more thorough accounting of uncertainty. So there is an uh, emphasis here on uncertainty because if you are providing information to decision makers, then uh, you have to give them uh, a sense of the uncertainty in the information you are providing. As is often said, the information being provided from the natural sciences, which are considered hard sciences, is somewhat soft in terms of uncertainties. But the decisions to be made includes social scientists, social sciences, which are typically called soft sciences. So soft sciences have to make the hard decisions based on this soft information. And remember the uncertainty well. The information producers have some sense of uncertainty. The decision makers tend to underplay it and then people who are far removed tend to uh, overestimate the uncertainties. So perception of uncertainty itself differs no matter how you quantify it. So this is a nice, nice paper from uh, I think Jochanan Kushner and colleagues which looks at the sources of predictability at various time scales uh, going from weather to sub-seasonal processes like Madden-Julian oscillation. If you don't know it, I have a, a podcast you can look up the North Atlantic oscillation and in the stratosphere you have sudden stratospheric warming, uh, quasi-biennial oscillations, uh, soil moisture, uh, ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, Pacific Decadal Variability and Atlantic Multi-Decadal Variability and then you have natural, natural and Anthropogenic Forcings. So these are predictable because we know the processes uh, that are kind of uh, controlling the uh, uh, observed patterns of these uh, variabilities at some time scales.
okay so those are the various time scales there and the prediction ranges go from days to weeks and sub seasonal goes uh, weeks to uh, a season and then you have seasonal decadal and climate projections so once you have an idea of the predictability uh, you can look at elements of near-term predictability so this is not so much about projections to 2100 but focusing on decision horizons of multiple years to decade or two decade or two okay so solar variability ozone layer atmospheric chemistry quasi-biennial oscillation we talked about as an interaction between the stratosphere and the uh, troposphere uh, El Nino and the tropical ocean atmosphere dynamics we understand a lot about it uh, once they evolve they have a certain uh, trajectories which are uh, fairly well predicted these days especially for El Nino uh, meridional overturning and the ocean dynamics slope uh, time scale process that is having a definite uh, signature uh, ocean heat salinity, carbon uptake, land, snow, sea ice, uh, and volcanic aerosols, anthropogenic aerosols, uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gases, and so on. And they also distinguish uh, initialization problems versus boundary conditions here. So these are kind of the boundary conditions that are prescribed, which means they are not prognostic. They are prescribed with some... Uh, for example, volcanic aerosols. Volcanoes cannot be predicted, uh, especially for historic simulations. You can use observations to impose them, and for the future, you need some sort of a, a, a compromise. But for decadal projections, it's mostly about initializing those as they exist and uh, leave it as uh, unpredictable for the near-term uh, predictability of the system. Okay? <coughs> so you also have to consider user needs uh, who need reliable and actionable information for decision making as I mentioned before the old idea of producing output and putting on websites and hoping that somebody will use them it's called the loading dock philosophy where you put stuff and you think trucks will come back and back up and load up stuff they think uh, they will use but it is shown now that usability and usefulness are not necessarily the same so that's what is meant by these and there are various sectors uh, at uh, S2S timescales of so-called sub-seasonal to seasonal timescales uh, which include short range, medium range, extended range and long range and the timescales, uh, the skills of predictions at these timescales depend on mid-latitudes where systems can be large scale and linger around for 10 days uh, whereas uh, in the tropics they are very fast evolving convective systems but within that you have things like Madden-Julian oscillation which are organized on sub-seasonal time scales and the monsoon which has a seasonal time scale and so on and so forth uh, lead to various sh uh, weather influenced actions like warnings uh, distribution of humanitarian aid evacuation uh, start monitoring forecast update contingency plans and so on so various examples of uh, actions are uh, uh, shown here uh, they have now a framework they called ready set go so they propose that things like agriculture disaster management water resource management health etc uh, can be uh, used as uh, to ready the system based on seasonal outlooks um, longer than 30 days and uh, ready set go so use the extended range 10 to 30 day forecast to set things in motion like where to place uh, rescue efforts, where to focus resources for uh, m managing water, etc. Uh, and go is where the short time uh, predictions uh, get things moving to reduce the impacts to protect uh, life and property or whatever. Okay, so that's the idea. And I will uh, make another podcast with the remaining slides uh, just to make. Uh, some more points more effectively but you get the idea that the uh, long-term projections have been discussed a lot in the media what will happen in 2100 in terms of heat waves uh, extreme events uh, cyclone intensities rapid intensification sea level rise and so on um, 
and more and more thought is being given now to see what is the value of information when it is given for 2100 versus uh, the so-called near term which is let's say 2030 where does it work best in terms of planning for mitigation and adaptation so we we'll look at adaptation and mitigation in the coming chapters uh, so decision horizons for human beings tend to be on the order of a decade and there is the political processes which determine uh, who makes the decisions and whether they will really worry about only the next election or they will actually worry about um, longer term plans right so now new administration in the US is taking climate actions so it has to be seen whether they will plan the near term or the longer term and there are sectors like the defense, military, and so on, which actually do plan for a longer term because if they want to build a new Navy base, for example, they have to worry about sea level rise out to several decades. They cannot do it based on next 10 years. And the additional constraint is that even if the projection locally says, let's say in Norfolk, Virginia, or in Goa, India, the sea level rise will be two meters, can you really afford to uh, protect against two meters of uh, sea level rise? So there is also some compromise involved in terms of uh, investments needed uh, and so on. So these are the complicated uh, links of going with uh, projections or near-term predictions uh, and implementing them into decisions. That's where the reliability and actionable information uh, becomes so critical.